And I'm going to be going basically through the entire book, giving you just the theme of Micah, reading quotes from the whole thing. There's only seven chapters, um, and I'll be pulling from it. And Micah's a prophet, and he warned Israel about coming judgment. Israel was in one of their rebellious times and complaining times. And um, there's some pretty clear direction from Micah in what you're supposed to do when you're a Christian. You know, there's just some scripture that's pretty clear. And one of those is the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, today we're going to hear another passage that's pretty undeniably clear. And I want to start this um, sermon by telling you a story that happened this week. I was talking with a dear friend on the phone who had lost a beloved family member. He, he didn't die from COVID, it was um, Alzheimer's. And um, the family gathered for uh, what they were able to do at the funeral home, limited numbers, uh, sp spaced out. And my friend and her family wore masks because there's some serious health issues in their family. When they got there, it soon became clear that they were being ridiculed and joked about because they chose to wear masks. And the other family members were snickering and talking amongst themselves about how silly they were. And then one of the family members came to talk to my friend and they got into dis to a discussion. And what this family member was uh, trying to convince my friend that it was all fake and that, um, you know, the, everything that you see out there about conspiracy. And, and my friend said, well, you know, I don't think it's fake. And, and basically, my friend's relative told her she was stupid and ignorant, which broke her heart because they, she loved this person. And she just walked away, and, and she didn't know what to make of it, but the funny thing, and then we talked about this, is both of these people claim Christ very strongly. How do you know how to be a Christian when we're in situations like that? How do you know? What is the criteria or the um, rubric when you're confronted by people you love who, who so adamantly disagree? Um, well, that's indirectly related to this, this sermon today. I think what we come out with at the end will be very helpful to you and to my friend on how to be a Christian. How to be a Christian when we see brothers and sisters being so, so mean. How do we do that? How do we maintain our faith and our integrity when we're called stupid or ridiculed for things that we feel are good for us. So I'm going to read my sermon, and it's going to sound much like a trial, because this, if you look at Micah, it's like there's a trial, and the Israelites are on trial, are the defendants, and Micah is the prosecuting attorney, <laughs> and God's the judge. So here we go. Hear ye, hear ye, court is now in session. The honorable almighty God and judge is presiding. In the case of the Lord God, Yahweh versus the people Israel, hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before our jury. And in the scripture, Micah mentions in chapter 3, that the jury is the mountains. Hear you mountains, the controversy of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people and he will contend with Israel. Hear the words of God. Oh my people. What have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. I have guided you 
given you every opportunity to follow me. I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. Do you not remember? I sent you worthy leaders, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And remember last week, Rahab, who sheltered the spies? Oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised against you and what Balaam answered? Do you not remember my instructions about how to live? These words I gave to you as I brought you into the promised land. Do you not remember your renewed covenant with me at Gilgal? I have loved and protected you, but you have forgotten this covenant and its benefits and have turned away from me. Oh my, those Israelites. Hmm. And immediately in John Grisham style, the people began their defense. As all creation witnesses the trial, Israel responds to these charges. And this is over in chapter 5. I think. With what shall we come before the Lord, before God on high? Shall we come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old, which is the choicest kind of offering? They are the most expensive of sacrifices. Surely this will impress you, O God. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Can these immense quantities of sacrifices please you? They're saying, look what we've done, God. What do you want? Should we give our firstborn sons as human sacrifices, as the surrounding pagan religions require? Would this be enough, O oh God? The people's defense is basically this, God, you're just too hard to please. What more do you want from us? And then there's a hushed silence in the room as Yahweh, Almighty God, rises to speak. And the proceedings come to a halt as God quietly begins to disclose just what is required. The words come through the mouth of a disappointed and angry, yet loving God, who desperately wants his people to come back to him. He says this in six, chapter 6. I have shown you a better way, what is truly good. I have told you what you must do. You see, I am not impressed with your empty religious rituals. They are no substitute for loyal devotion. I told you this through Moses and Samuel and others. You heard it. Did you not really listen? I don't want your pious worship or your extravagant, expensive sacrifices. What do I require of you? Oh my gosh, listen, Israelites, listen, Garden Baptist. I seek three simple things more than anything else from you, my people. I want you to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Nothing more is needful. Micah 6, 8, if you memorize anything, memorize this. What does the Lord require of you? Do justice to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. That's what God requires. And the jury, the mountains and the hills and the foundations of the earth bring forth its verdict. What say ye, jury foreman? We find Israel, the people, guilty. Guilty of following the letter of God's law, but not the intent of it. Guilty of having not an intimate knowledge of Yahweh, but a head knowledge. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Court is adjourned. Hmm. I just paraphrased Micah for you. Okay? Micah helps us to bring some crucial points out. And in this trial-like structure and wording, it isn't too much of a stretch to say and to experience the word of God being spoken directly to us, not simply to the people of Israel so long ago, directly to us, directly to us. As a matter of fact, anytime you study the prophets of the Old Testament, you can pretty much count on their words being relevant today. 
As a matter of fact, again, we're like Israel and the requirements of God are the same. We are the new Israel. We are associated to these forerunners of ours. We meaning the church of Jesus Christ in the world, not just the United States of America. The church universal. The big question is, where would we stand today if the trial we had just heard were to happen right now? Where would we stand? What would our answer be if God were to say, oh my people, what have I done to you? What does the Lord require of us? Well, it's the same. It's the same. The first requirement is to do justice, to act justly. Now, that was a missing virtue in the Israelites at this time because Micah tells us that they were dishonest, they were violent, and they were liars. Hmm. Sound familiar? They charged the people with injustices of many kinds. But chapter 2 speaks of their plotting, their wickedness, their fraud, their threats, violence, stealing, and mistreating widows. Chapter 3, they were described as those who hated good and loved evil, hated justice and loved unfairness, and they were murderers. Oh my goodness, this, this is God's people we're talking about. They were really totally unlike the God they claimed to worship. It's kind of like the way I felt about my story and my friend. Her relation, her kin, wasn't acting like the God that he claimed to follow. Yahweh, the Lord God, is a God of justice and he demands justice of his people. And the righteousness that is rooted in God's nature must be demonstrated in the lives of his people. Like a legal process ending in a correct verdict, the morality must exemplify justice. What does this mean? What does this ask us to do? Are we doing justice? Well, how do we do that? How do we look at that and say, what's it mean? I can't speak for you, so I'll speak for me. This is what I believe it means. I am the part of the church of Jesus Christ, and I answer this question from the perspective of a white, middle-class, Protestant woman. And I must realize that that's the lens through which I answer this question. What does it mean to act justly? When people start throwing the word justice around, I get a little uncomfortable. It's associated many times with politics. And while policies and laws and people have a million different opinions as to the way justice should be done, I believe that our criteria is Yahweh God. And he asks us to act justly. And so I have to figure out what that means. It means to me that, that I'm fair and I'm just in my relating to others. I look out for those among us who are being treated poorly and unfairly, and I speak up. It's not difficult to see that there are millions of people around the world who are not being treated justly. Where do I start? What can I do? We all can't move to Washington and lobby, but we can start at the beginning. And the very beginning is to simply realize that not everybody lives the way I do. And to teach my children that. There's a phrase for what we need to be, and, and young adults, people say, you need to be woke. We need to be woke. The very first thing we have to do to live justly is to be woke. Because the reality is that we all get pretty myopic, and if you go to the, the eye doctor and, and you have nearsightedness, that means you have myopia. You're myopic. You can only see what's in front of you. So, so the first thing that you have to do to be able to live justly is to not be myopic. We forget that two-thirds of the world lives in absolute poverty, that the world is not like Indianapolis or Wayne Township. We forget it sometimes. And, and we don't, even in our own city, often allow what's going on to to hurt us, to break our hearts. We have been so overloaded with so many things, but I want to lift up some things that have happened in the world alongside COVID. 
in the last six weeks. In February, there was a man jogging in Georgia who got shot. And it would seem that he got shot because he was African-American, Ahmaud Aubrey. In April, at 30th and Keystone, there was an eight-year-old boy sitting at his dinner table who got hit by a stray bullet. His name's Roderick Payne. He is the cutest, cutest little boy. Have no idea where that bullet came from. Just a couple of weeks ago, there was a 16-year-old girl at 38th and Arlington driving in a car with her mother, Naya Cope, and she was hit by a stray bullet. Now, all these people have been African-American, and that is definitely something to be woke about. But there was also a white mail carrier on the east side that was shot because she was afraid to go into a yard that had a dog to deliver a stimulus check. And her name's Angela Summers. And then just last week, Brianna Taylor in Louisville was shot when police went to the wrong apartment looking for a criminal, and she was shot 26 times. I don't tell you all these things to make you sad, although I think to live justly, we've got to let these things hurt us like they hurt the heart of God. But the first thing that we have to do to live justly is to not shield ourselves or shelter ourselves or make ourselves not be aware of what's happening in the world. We have to know. Now some say, well, I, I just don't want to know all that pain. Then you can't hurt like God hurts for the injustices of the world. And I believe that there will be ways, if you allow yourselves to be woke, that you can minister or help. I don't know what those are going to be for you, but the first step is to be woke. So being aware that there's injustices daily, that things are happening. You know, one of the ways that I have to be woke is, is realizing that the folks back home in West Virginia have a completely different view of the world because they are dying on the vine. They don't have industry. They, they are um, very, very much in crisis. And it's not my experience, but I have to open my eyes. We have to educate ourselves to act justly. The second requirement of God is to love kindness or mercy. The Hebrew word is hesed. It means unfailing kindness. It's a love that does not let go. Unfailing kindness. I'm going to love you no matter what. I'm going to love you even if you're mean to me. I won't take abuse, but I will still love you. That word is used 240 times in the Old Testament, especially when it's talking about God's covenant for his people. A strong love, a generous love, a forgiving love. Now, Israel, they based all their worship on ritual, but not really love of God. And it's mercy and love in action, in fact, true worship, that pleases God. What do we do? Do we try to impress God with our worship? What are our motives? Take a look at what your motives are. If they are anything other than just expressing love to God, then your motives are missing the mark. I have a quote from Mother Teresa. She says, spread love everywhere you go. First of all, in your own house. <laughs> Give love to your children, to your wife or husband, to a next door neighbor. Let no one ever come to you without leaving better and happier. Be the living expression of God's kindness Kindness in your face, kindness in your eyes, kindness in your smile, kindness in your warm greeting. That's hard to do with a mask on. You have to try to emote with your eyes. It's hard to do if you're ridiculed about wearing a mask or if you run into somebody who doesn't take your health 
under consideration by wearing a mask. You know, really wearing a mask is a compassionate act for somebody else. It's really protecting other people, not us. Being kind is letting it go when somebody pulls out in front of you or gets angry on the highway. Don't show retribution. Quite frankly, you might get shot. So for your health and to please God, just let it go. You know, don't you love it when you see somebody on the highway with that bumper sticker, honk if you love Jesus, or something like that, but then how many times do we see somebody with a sticker, honk if you love Jesus, doing something completely rude and inappropriate? I'm like, oh my goodness, you're making our job as Christians so hard. How about your kindness factor at home? With your children, especially now. What about respect and speaking with respect? We have this sense of freedom on the internet that we can say anything we absolutely want to without consequence. That is not true in God's economy. You know me, I'm on Facebook. I've deleted an awful lot of things I started to post this week. When looking, is it needed? Is it kind? Yes, it might prove a political point, but I deleted it. Because there's just no use. There's just no use. Being kind. I'm going to ask you to do some kind things. If the 30 of us did three kind acts today, 90 people would be touched by kindness in the name of Jesus. One kind thing that we could do is I'm going to send you the addresses for Rose and Gary, and I, I want to love bomb them. B-O-M-B. It's hard for me to say. Love bomb. Love bomb Gary and Rose with cards. I challenge you to do that. And then the last thing that God asks is for us to live humbly, to walk humbly. This is against everything in our fleshly nature, to walk humbly. Walking humbly does not mean being a doormat. Walking humbly is not having to be right. Walking humbly is not having to be the center of attention. Walking humbly is uh, giving somebody a place in line. Walking humbly is not sweating the small stuff. Walking humbly, oh my goodness, we can change the world. Alex Haley has this, when he had an office, uh, in his office, there was a poster with a, a turtle on top of a, a fence post, a turtle on top of a fence post. And Alex said, if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he had some help. Wow, that's true. We are all turtles on fence posts, folks. We don't get anywhere in this life without the help of somebody. We can't fix it all ourselves. We can't make it all good. We have to have help. And recognizing that is a part of being humble. And not taking what we have for granted. It breaks the back of self-centeredness, which is our flesh, to realize that we're turtles on a fence post and we had to have help getting there. So what does Jesus require of us right now when times are so difficult? To do justly, to love, kindness, to walk humbly with our Lord. That's our challenge this week. I challenge you to remember that. Memorize Micah 6, 8 this week. I challenge you to memorize Micah 6, 8. As we sing our closing hymn, it's I picked footsteps of Jesus because that's really uh, what we're talking about. Walking as Jesus walked. 